Good afternoon. Um, coming off of bye week, I'll just give you um, an assessment of kind of how we spent our time. Uh, bye week is an opportunity for us to get a couple significant things done and uh, feel comfortable with what, the, what we were able to get done. Obviously, you measure it by how you're able to utilize that time and information for our good as we move forward. But we spent some time focusing on us, uh, what we've done uh, schematically. Um, we've also spent some time looking at division of labor roles, what we've asked people to do, analysis of those things, and uh, with an eye toward how we move forward. Um, we spent some time looking at things that are trending in football, things that are going on outside of us, but uh, that we're very much a part of, trends in the game and how the game's being played, how the game is being played out globally, if you will. And then lastly, we spent some time updating and preparing ourselves uh, for the Cleveland Browns, our next opponent. And, you, and largely, that's how you spend a bye week, but I was extremely comfortable with the things that we were able to get done. Uh, we were able to spend some time talking about uh, specific issues relative to people that are available to us. Um, I'll, I'll start now talking about some of those things, personnel-related things, who's available, who's not. Um, we largely got, got, got a healthy football team. Uh, we have a group of guys that, that maybe missed some time in the last game or, or in recent games that are participating in a limited like capacity, uh, but we're excited about their inclusion in our work. Uh, Morgan Burnett worked some yesterday. Um, he'll continue to work in a partial capacity. We'll let that be our guide in terms of his potential availability. Uh, Darius Hayward Bay with his ankle, same thing. Uh, Fort with his ankle, uh, same thing. Uh, we'll look at some others um, along those lines, but uh, those are the guys in most recent times have missed some time and uh, are working their way back to us. Um, excited about that. Um, you know, you spend some time looking at the Cleveland Browns and preparing for them. They're a group that presents some very specific challenges, and they're different in some ways than they were the last time we played them. And so I'll spend some time talking about that. Uh, first, on the offensive side, the most significant change is, is Baker Mayfield. And um, here's a guy that, that has a competitive spirit. Uh, you can describe it in a variety of ways. Some call it moxie or, or what have you. But the bottom line is, and this guy's a tremendous competitor. Um, he makes plays that way. Uh, he's always made plays that way. Uh, it's helpful to him, but it's also helpful to his team because I'd imagine that people gain energy off competitors and guys that play ball that way. You see it when you watch their tape. I think it goes beyond the playmaking that he brings. I think he's a catalyst for good for them. I think he inspires others with his spirit and how he approaches it. And I think uh, his inclusion in play has been a positive uh, thing for them. I think. Uh, Ninjoku, their young tight end, is emerging in terms of the splash plays that he's providing them consistently. Uh, his ability to be a, a big-time situational target, that red zone touchdown um, against Tampa last week, but also some situational things, third down. Uh, he's very much a part of it. And, and you see his inclusion and his role growing since the last time we played him. Uh, now it's Landry and him and, and Duke Johnson, particularly like on third downs. Um, see some big time growth there. At the running back position, uh, Nick Chubb is their featured runner now, and not surprised by that. Studied Nick a lot when he came out. Um, you know, a lot of guys when they come out are, are, you know, you're forecasting what their professional game looks like because they're redshirt sophomores or third year juniors and so forth. I mean, this guy seemingly played ball for about eight years down there at Georgia. You know, um, there was no guesswork with this guy. This guy had an extended body of work from a college football standpoint, to meet him in the draft process, you saw the maturity in his person. Um, so going through that process is not surprising that they felt comfortable enough to move Hyde and, and feature him. Um, you know, he's a grown man, so we got to minimize his impact on it and know that they're going to work to, to include him in the game and not only him, but Duke Johnson uh, is a formidable situational guy and concept guy both in the run and in the past. We've uh, seen that from him a lot. Uh, on the other side of the ball, I just think it's about the growth and development of, of top quality talent. You know, um, Miles Garrett's first overall pick. Ward is um, extremely high. Uh, Pep is extremely high. Um, they got quality players at every position. And uh, those guys are continually coming together 
and, and, and the play reflects it. Uh, the splash plays specifically reflect the pedigree. Um, they're what, plus 10 in the, in the turnover ratio. They're number one in the league. They produced 20 turnovers. Um, what happened in our game was no lightning strike. Uh, these guys are producing turnovers every stadium they step into. I think the Charger game was the only game where they, they weren't producing turnovers in bunches, and you see how that game unfolded. It's going to be a big challenge for us uh, to maintain possession of the ball, to minimize the talents of some of this top talent that I talked about, like Miles Garrett, his sack fumble ability and Ward's ability to come back with the ball and Pep's line of scrimmage run game impact and blitzing ability and so forth. Um, they're, they're continually coming together with top flight talent. Um, they're getting better each and every week. Um, they, they're providing their team a wave that their team is riding in there working their way back into games and getting into games because of the turnovers that these guys are producing. Uh, it happened against us in the fourth quarter um, in week one. Um, you know, one of their drives was a one-yard drive because they gave their offense an extremely short field. They provided that same short field for their offense last week against Tampa. Um, red zone turnovers, they get extremely uh, stingy when your offense is on the short field. That's been a signature of, of their turnovers as well. Um, you know, we, we threw an interception with the ball on the 13-yard line in the red zone, came away with no points. Um, Baltimore, I think, had second and two on the two going in um, and, and turned the ball over on the interception, no points. Man, those lack of points obviously are significant in terms of how these games are unfolding. Um, so we got to work our tails off, man, to, to minimize the impact of special talent there. You can't deny also um, they got quality coordination. Greg Williams been at it for a long time. Uh, we got to do a good job, but more than anything, man, the focus is us and how we come out of this bye week, um, getting back on the train, if you will, and doing so in a fast and fluid manner and playing the type of ball uh, that we were playing as we went into the bye week. Um, questions? Mike, what, what could possibly or what, what would Morgan Burnett's role be at this point moving forward? You know, that's going to be determined as he displays availability. And that availability is being able to put consecutive practice get days together. Um, and, and so uh, we're going to give them an opportunity to practice. We gave him an opportunity to practice yesterday in a partial capacity, not at the expense of others, because he hasn't proven that consistent availability yet. As he does, then we'll infuse him in and, and, and potentially define a role for him and get him ready to play. But we got a number of days. He's a veteran player. Uh, he's very good above the neck. Uh, the first things first, though, is the consistent health, being able to walk on the field, participate, walk off the field, and repeat process. Are you happy with the play of your, your safety zone to this point? Man, I, I, I'm very uh, hesitant to acknowledge happiness with anything. You know, we're just trying to get better. Mike, you're going for two when you're down 14 and you score a touchdown becoming a trend globally. And do you have any thoughts on that? I don't have any thoughts on that. Like I mentioned, Cleveland's improvement since week one. How about yourself? How do you feel about the way your team has developed? You know, we're, we're just trying to improve in all areas every day. Um, I know I say that to you and it sounds like a cliche, but it's not. Um, we got to continually be a group on the rise. And the only way that you do that is you, you're, you're a group of individuals on the rise. Um, guys have a better understanding of their roles, their assignments. Uh, they execute with greater detail. They play with greater speed. They understand what it is they're doing and how it fits into the big picture of what we're doing. Uh, you have opportunities for growth in those areas every day. And uh, we work our tails off to improve in those areas, to gain those understandings, to find that fluidity. Because uh, we acknowledge, man, as you go on this journey, man, the road gets narrow. And we want to be one of the teams that stays on that road. And so uh, you better be getting better every day. Forget where you are. Forget what happens specifically as you step into a stadium, win or lose. Obviously, the goal is to win. But as you step out of stadiums, you better make a commitment to be better the next stadium you step in. And so that's where we put our focus um, and, or try to and, uh, and we'll continue. You evaluate your team during the bye, like you discussed. What did you learn about your team? You know, um, a myriad of things. Um, not anything that I'm trying to paint with a broad brush and sell to you guys. It's just about how we continually work to get better to increase our chances of winning as we go into a stadium and play. Um, the definitional roles, the division of labor, um, the utilization of people, 
uh, our schematics. Uh, we analyzed it all. It was one of the trends you guys were talking about during that time, the proliferation of offense and the importance of scoring and scoring early uh, and what's become a more offensively oriented game. You know, that's, that's low-hanging fruit, though. That's easy. Uh, all you got to do is watch a game, and that's evident. Um, you know, we're, we're in the more minutia, specifically, how do we get that done within our personality and with our people, and how do you counteract those things uh, that are going on globally defensively? We know my players do it, but how much and how seriously do you allow yourselves conversations about Patrick Peterson when he says he wants to trade? I don't play that hypothetical game. Um, you know, we, we focus on us and, you know, potential free agents and so forth. It's our normal business. Um, I just don't delve into the hypothetical fodder about who's potentially available and who's not. You know, some of those things are just speculation. There's no, you know, there's no significance or anything real to it. So why comment on it? Why think about it? Why waste one iota of our time? We got real tangible issues relative to guys that are on our team uh, that need to be addressed. Would you like to add or, would, or do you feel comfortable with the group? I've been focused on the guys that we have here working right now. And the same goes for Le'Veon, if anybody got any of those questions. <laughs> you know, um, the guys that are here working have our attention and focus, and appropriately so. We'll deal with some of the potential of some of those other hypothetical things as they fall at our feet. Mike, well, Mike just, being as so that uh, you're going to face Cleveland, get back from Cleveland, they were a little stingier against the Ravens than the Steelers were. Is there any strategy that you might maybe indirectly borrow from in terms of how you might uh, play Baltimore? I mean, how you might play uh, Cleveland? I hadn't looked at that. I've just been, you know, man, we got an extended body of work versus these guys and their people, meaning Todd Haley, Greg Williams. There's enough tangible, relatable things in terms of how they play football with who they have to play football with versus how we play football with who we have to play football with. Um, you know, it, it, there's not a lot of secrets in matchups like this. So um, I'm not going to pretend to unearth some, you know, some ridiculous nugget. Uh, we better play good football, we better tackle, we better take care of the football, we better stop them from gaining possession of the football. Those fundamental things that may not be attractive in settings like this are what's going to determine the outcome of the game. Much has been made about the returns of Lady on Bell or lack thereof, but you're putting up similar numbers uh, with James Conner. Um, you know, but speaking outside of the running backs themselves for a second, talk about the Band of Brothers, the offensive line, uh, and Coach Munchak and how they've been able to uh, ensure that those numbers stay consistent. You know, we're not trying to ensure that numbers stay consistent, particularly as it relates to 17. You know, those 17 variables are so different. That's a different group of guys. So there's really nothing to compare it to. We're just trying to be good. We're trying to run it. We're trying to throw it. We're trying to have balance. We're trying to control the line of scrimmage. We realize uh, our big boys are central to that. Um, we're trying to increase our chances of winning. And, and so the, the discussion that you bring up is central to that in terms of uh, winning by attrition, controlling the floor of the game, and doing so um, in, a, in a cleaner and, and more efficient manner as you walk the journey. Um, that's what we're trying to get done. Um, not only in the offensive line and with the running game or the running back position, but with our football team. Yeah, Mike Foster was talking about Connor yesterday. He used one of your phrases about embracing AFC North football, and he feels like he has done that more and more in this second year of his. And one thing he pointed to was he doesn't go out of bounds nearly as much. He said he might have had a talk with him somewhere along the way about that. Um, is that true? Have you noticed his willingness to embrace contact and not go out of bounds so much? And do, you, do you remember what he's talking about in that regard? Again, you know, it's nothing dramatic there. Um, we expect all our second-year players to be dramatically better. Um, Juju's better. T.J. Watt's better. Um, he's better. Um, we've been singing that song, man, since I've been standing at this podium. Uh, it's reasonable to expect those guys to be better in all areas between year one and year two because of their experience and their knowledge, and he's no different. Did he particularly get better after that fumble in Cleveland when it comes to still running hard, running with contact, and not worry about it? Man, that guy ran hard at Pitt. That guy, I assume he ran hard in high school at Erie. Um, that's one of his calling cards. So, you know, um, he is who he is in that regard. Mike, what will Artie's role be coming up, and what's he got to do to get better? We'll determine that with the quality of his work and the work of others in practice. And, uh, you know, he's got to keep working. Um, he got to smile in the face of adversity. Uh, young guys in the National Football League go through periods of lulls in play. 
uh, particularly in the secondary position, particularly at the cornerback position. You see it time and time again. Oftentimes, they're defined, their careers are defined by how they respond to it, um, how they smile in the face of the adversity, how they remain unwavered, how they continue to work through the misery. Um, so he'll be given that opportunity. He's been given that opportunity. I like the way he's worked. Uh, the other guys have been given the same opportunity. Uh, we'll just keep punching the clock. Uh, I know that when you step in the stadiums and you step across that white line, you'll have an opportunity to show that growth. Because uh, when you got negative plays on tape at the cornerback position, people are going to throw at you. And that's how it goes. Hugh Jackson said he's going to have more input on the Browns offense. How do you expect that to, to I have no idea, nor do I care. What needs to happen for all this coming out of Navy to get on the active rush and down the stretch? They got to get healthy. We got to clear them. Hadn't happened yet. Same for Eli? Yes. Mike, Anybody on on any of those lists? Mike, have you coached against a team that uh, Hugh Jackson was the OC of? Oh yes. Yeah, so you know. Yes, many times over the years. That's why it doesn't. It's it's less relevant to us his inclusion or or play calling. Uh, we've competed against Coach Haley. Obviously, we've competed against Hugh. Hugh called plays over there. I think the last couple of years, Hugh called plays in Cincinnati. Yeah, so I mean, the other teams that yeah, so we've you know. We're familiar with those guys and their personalities and the ramifications of his potential inclusion and so forth. Uh, some of those things you can't answer until you get in stadium, and we understand that. That's why we're focused on the things that we should be focused on, our prep, and the things that we see from them on video. Terod Taylor picked up a few chunks of yards with his legs against you guys in week one. Are you noticing them with Baker allowing him to run that much? Are they trying to restrain him? I mean, I don't can run. He's athletic. Are they allowing him to run? I don't see any restrictions in that regard. Um, um, I, I don't. Uh, both guys are mobile. Um, you know, Tyrod's probably more of a runner once it breaks down. Uh, Baker probably um, works to extend plays. Um, and there's probably the difference in terms of the numbers, the raw numbers in terms of the yardage. Um, but they're both equally dangerous because the bottom line is that mobility allows them to extend plays. It allows them to create seemingly when something else isn't there. And, and so that's something to be reckoned with. Um, and so we got a lot of work in that regard in terms of minimizing the mobility aspect in terms of how, it, how the game plays out, especially situationally. Um, possession downs, uh, red zone play. Um, it's going to be a challenge. Have they done anything specifically to create so many turnovers, disguise well, the six threats? No, I, I think what it is is that they're a very fundamental group and they're putting this young, talented group in position to make plays and they're not overcomplicating things for them, I think. Uh, the guys are playing fast, they're hunting the ball, they're ball aware, they're displaying that ball awareness. Um, they're, they're doing a heck of a job. Anything else for Coach? Coach, in the offseason, um, you made the adjustment at linebacker, which uh, team didn't want to do pretty opposite sides. Halfway through the season, how do you feel about that adjustment? You know, we're comfortable with the move. Um, we'll continue to watch it. Um, we're not opposed to doing anything, the, the movement of anyone to, to better us. And um, it's been helpful thus far. Um, by, by no means are we married to it. I think, if nothing else, it's sh shown us that both guys are – are flexible, and it's probably going to provide opportunities for us from a physical matchup standpoint over the second half of the year, of maybe allowing Bud to match up against tackles that he, you know, matches up against from a skill or talent or physical uh, standpoint. And the same with TJ. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, guys.